Hey guys, Mark Sisson here, uh, Primal Blueprint Podcast, coming to you from the new studios, temporary studios in Pacific Palisades, uh, a house that I occupy because the house I used to have in Malibu burned down. Uh, but anyway, I'm here today with uh, Paul Saladino, who is on his way to San Diego yeah. to move and uh, stopping through town. And I said, "Let's, we got to get together. We got to do a, we have to have a chat because this is such an interesting topic. It's such a hot topic in the world of ways of eating these days, um, the carnivore diet. Uh, and we will, uh, we're going to just let this conversation go where it goes. Um, but uh, welcome, Paul. Thanks for having me, man. It's good to be here. This is a beautiful spot. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, it's it is. pretty gorgeous. Um, thanks. And uh, I have to start. We met in, um, I think, Paleo FX. Yeah. First time. And uh, I'm a student of people's names. And I, y- your name, Salad, I know. Salad, no. And I mean, it, people do sort of what their names suggest. And I'm like, that was the first thing that came to mind to me was this guy has picked the perfect, you know, uh, metier, if you will. People always make a remark about the name and say, oh, how can this guy talk about the carnivore diet? He's got salad in his last name. And yeah. my reply was always, well, I also have dino in my last yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I would use the dinosaurs that were carnivorous as my sort of spirit animals more than the there river. You than yeah. the, but you're right. I think somebody else noticed that. Salad, I, no. Yeah. I don't need it. Yeah. I, uh, one of my favorite ones was Sinead O'Connor. Uh-huh. And if you put a K uh, and an H in there, you get skinhead <laughs> into Sinead. And I always thought that was like, okay, how many, people didn't pick up on that. So, anyway, I'm always looking for those little things. Those little it's linguistic little puzzles. All right, on to the topic, which is the carnivore diet. Um, a little bit about you. So you're just coming out of residency. Uh, so t- let's nutshell sort of the history and how you got to this carnivore diet phase. It's been a wild journey, Mark. Uh, so my dad's a doctor. I grew up with medicine in my family. I was a PA before I went to medical school. So I worked as a PA in cardiology. That's a physician assistant for four years. Pretty quickly when I was working as a PA, I thought, ah, medical system, I'm not so happy about this. Really, the paradigm in Western medicine is to treat the symptom. We are told in medical school which pill to give. That's basically what we're taught. And we're never really challenged to think about what the root cause of an illness is. But as I went further in medicine, I kind of got obsessed with that. And I found functional medicine, which is a sort of a branch of westernized medicine where people are looking for the root cause. And there's a variety of people who would call themselves functional medicine practitioners. But when I started going down the rabbit hole of what do people think might be causing the illnesses that we see in westernized society, that kind of led me to functional medicine, and that was the impetus for returning to medical school in 2015, well, in 2011, at the University of Arizona, with the intention of kind of getting a more uh, full education, getting the doctoral degree to have more autonomy, to practice root cause medicine. Mm-hmm. I ended up going to residency at the University of Washington to continue that, and now I'm done with that journey. And it's been, a, it's been what I've kind of come to repeatedly is that the biggest lever is food. Yeah. And there are lots of levers, right? There are a lot of things that cause illness for people. Sleep problems, emotional stressors, toxins in the environment. Food is a big lever. Mm. Food is probably the biggest. In my opinion, the biggest lever. You won't get any, uh, you know, disagreement on that in this community. And I think that that is, that is a pretty radical concept though, because if you talk to westernized physicians, very few of them appreciate that or even would accept that. And so I think that a lot of the discussion, you know, between this community and Western medicine is like, hey guys, food affects this, whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, whether it's rheumatologic diseases, inflammatory autoimmune disease there, whether it's dermatologic autoimmune disease, whether it's psychiatric disease, Mm -hmm. food affects these illnesses in a way that is profound. And I really think Western medicine has missed the boat here because if we were accepting of that strength that the strength of that connection, we would be taught in medical school more nutrition. For sure. And there would be more people thinking about this. We wouldn't all have to agree on what we thought the food was that would trigger or not trigger, but we need to be thinking about it and asking those questions and at least challenging the paradigm that there's no, there's no effect of food because that's, a, that's just ludicrous in my opinion. So throughout the process, I've been kind of iterating in my brain what I think the best diet is for me and whether that translates to other people. Mm-hmm. The, kind of this overarching question, is there a good diet for humans? Is, is it very individual? Is one person meant to be a vegan? Is one person meant to be a carnivore? Another person meant to be paleo or primal? How does this all work? And again, this is just sort of my personal journey. And I was paleo and familiar with your stuff and doing pretty much a primal diet, you know, for years and years, 10, mm-hmm. 12 years. 
before I got to the last year where I kind of had this left turn into the carnivore world. <laughs> and it was pretty good. I mean, I was pretty much 100% organic paleo, really intentional about the foods I was eating and where they were coming from. And then, you know, I had a few things that wouldn't quite resolve. Mm -hmm. I had eczema that didn't go away completely. And that was really the biggest impetus. I think that if I had not had persistent eczema, which is not a hugely debilitating thing, it's just kind of a just itchy, annoying. And an itchy rash. But yeah. I was doing a lot of jujitsu in medical school, and so I'd get it on my knees, it got infected, mm. you know, I'd get it on my elbows. It was a nuisance. And the more I did that kind of stuff, I, I just, I got more of the eczema. And I thought, there is something out of balance here. Eczema is an autoimmune disease in the skin, similar to psoriasis, but very different pathology, at least histologically. Yeah. There is something else going on here. I'm missing something. And you know, I heard Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson talk on Joe Rogan. I thought, that's an interesting concept because what they were talking about was the resolution of autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of, in my opinion, the holy grail. As I progressed through medicine, what I realized was that most illness was inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Most chronic illness was inflammatory and inflammation and autoimmunity became synonyms, yes. synonyms for me and I thought, what is causing inflammation? That's the million dollar question I think that everybody wants to know now. What is causing inflammation? Because you can pick a disease. Yeah. It's inflammatory and yep, it's a chronic at some disease. Levels, yeah. Yep. Yep. So what is causing that? And I think we go back to the issue, food, mm -hmm. and then which food, and how could food be triggering that? And so the persistence of autoimmunity in me said, oh, maybe there's a little inflammation sticking around here. And the idea that people with a carnivore diet, probably much like you, I was just hearing anecdote after anecdote, Resolution of autoimmune disease. I was taught in medical school that was impossible to yeah, cure. Yeah. Nobody's ever fixed that. You know? Prednisone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Disease modifying yeah, 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 agents, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Michaela had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. She had hip replacement. Jordan had bad sort of arthritis in the same vein. And then you go down the rabbit hole, you see people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, psoriasis, and you think, these are diseases that I've never seen anyone get better from in my training. Yep. So I've been in medicine, yep. I was four years as a PA, four years in medical school, four years in residency. You know, I never saw anybody get better from those diseases with what Western medicine was doing. And then to see, you know, tens, hundreds of people improving, you think that's something I need to study. Yep. Whether or not that's the end all and be all remains to be seen, but that's something you want to study. And, you know, similarly, I had a vegan phase mm -hmm. 14, 15 years ago, and I thought that was interesting too. I didn't get a chance to study those anecdotes, but there are anecdotes in the vegan world that suggest that people with these sort of recalcitrant autoimmune diseases get better sometimes. So that's a valuable thing to study as well. When I was coming from the paleo perspective, I think the carnivore idea kind of grabbed me and I thought, Is, let's see if there's anything to this because I was steeped in functional medicine at that mm -hmm. point. That was really a year ago. And in functional medicine, the teaching is, oh, plants are good. Plants have polyphenols. Plants have fiber. Plants have benefit. So it's, it's quite counterculture to what yeah, I had yeah. learned to say, you know, maybe, maybe they're not a benefit. And so that was the beginning of this kind of rabbit hole and it's been it's just like Alice falling down yeah. the wonderland. It's just like you just kind of end over end thinking this is amazing, and then you end up in some <clears throat> wild world that you didn't expect, but it's a really neat journey. Um, so your residency was in functional medicine? Residency was in psychiatry. Okay. All yeah. Right. Okay. Functional medicine training was outside of residency. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's functional medicine training through the Institute of Functional Medicine. It's sort of like extracurricular training that you yeah, do. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in psychiatry, um, there has to be recognition that some ketogenic diets have an impact there or no? Not within the mainstream. Wow. Not within the mainstream teaching as of yet. So I was at the University of Washington, which is a pretty well-respected university, and I think academia moves slowly. You, you think? Yeah. <laughs> I think it moves pretty slowly. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. And yeah, I was never talked to about the ketogenic diet. I kind of discovered it on my own mm -hmm. in residency, and I was never talked to about paleolithic diets or primal diets or a carnivore diet or... Uh, things like methylation, which if you look at the literature is quite commonly talked about yeah. with psychiatric illness. And really, in my four years of residency at, I would argue, one of the top universities in the country, if not the world, no one ever talked about psychiatric disease as inflammatory. I kind of found that on my own, and you're going, yeah. how come you guys never told me about this? Like, look, there's clear evidence that psychiatric illness is inflammatory. Yeah. And there's activation of the immune system in the brain, and, it, and it's probably not coming from the brain. So tell me, like sch schizophrenia. For right. instance, um, can you can you now uh, posit that there's a dietary etiology to that? Absolutely, and we've really? known that for a long time. Yeah. And it's again, every every individual psychiatric illness is a little bit unique and probably nuanced. Uh, the prototypical one is you know sort of recalcitrant in depression or anxiety. But yeah. I would say yeah, there's a clear dietary component to schizophrenia. The problem is that people are so impaired functionally that yeah. 
how are you going to get somebody get schizophrenic started. Get started to, to do a paleolithic primal carnivore yeah. diet? You know, I, I'm driving uh, to Malibu this morning for uh, a session. Um, I'm listening to sort of a local NPR station and talking about the homeless problem in, yeah. in um, Los Angeles. And so much of it is not people who just missed a paycheck. It's mental, it's, it's mental issues. It's schizophrenia. It's, that's a huge part of this homeless issue. You know, and so I, I, I like to think in terms of like where are we going to, you know, I- exert our influence if we if we can. Um, and I've I've always sort of had a soft spot for this homeless homelessness issue, uh, and the the fact that you know some of it could be addressed with better nutrition, without a doubt. You know, is is pretty compelling. You know, there are these state hospitals, and this gets into like the political realm. And in Washington, they're kind of losing funding. There's all of these sort of, I think it's state by state the um, the controversies around the funding of state hospitals for mental institutions. Right. And I, I personally feel like these are a good thing for people. Oftentimes there are patients who are so sick that they really can't be cared for chronically in yeah. a non-state hospital. But, you know, you, you wonder how cool would it be, and I saw this firsthand in residency at the University of Washington, that the patients are not fed good food, right? Oh, my God. It's oatmeal, orange juice, Jello. Uh, skim milk, right. a cookie. Right. right. <laughs> it's gluten. Yeah. And it's, and it's incredibly triggering yeah. foods, yeah. you know? And so there, there is a clear ability. There's a clear platform for intervention here. Let's yeah. give these people a paleolithic diet. Let's yeah. give these people a primal diet. Let's give these people a carnivore diet and see how they do. But there's so much red tape between here and there. But, you know, people in inpatient psychiatric facilities or state hospitals, I think that some of the most powerful interventions could be Mm. Just simple dietary interventions. I talked about that. I mean, there's clear evidence, and I brought this up to some of my, you know, the physicians I worked with when I was in residency. It's clear evidence that gluten specifically at a very high level yeah. triggers people at a psychotic level. And I said, why don't we just put this person on a gluten-free diet? And yeah. it, was, it was always poo-pooed. It <laughs> never happened in residency. I did not succeed in getting a single patient on a gluten-free diet in the hospital. That's crazy to me because it's there's enough good evidence that you would think at least somebody could put together a study and, you know, and control it. And, and determine whether or not it's, uh, you know, some, um, idle, you know, banter from a, a, a psychi- psychiatrist in training, or it's an actual thing that could be, um, if not cured or reversed, certainly mitigated. There are studies from the 60s and 70s, maybe the 50s. I mean, I don't think they were quite as well controlled as studies now, but there's all these studies suggesting nutritional interventions for psychiatric illness. There's a great study from, uh, um, uh, Mass General McLean. So mm-hmm. McLean mm-hmm. in the 1980s, they did a study with phosphatidylcholine, yeah. which is you know a precursor for the choline molecule, mm-hmm. which is used to make membranes. And they gave people lecithin, and you can get choline and things like egg yolks, egg yolks, yeah. you know, or liver is a good source of choline, or mm-hmm. muscle meat from a grass-fed mm-hmm. animal is a good source of choline. But they gave people lecithin, and these were people with bipolar illness. And it was a small study, but it was really compelling how how much improvement they saw in the conversion from mania to what we would call euthymia. Yeah. So these are people who are manic, and they gave them phosphatidylcholine. They had pretty impressive results in a small study. It's never been repeated. Oh, it's never been repeated. Or, or incorporated as any sort of treatment protocol, no, right? No, yeah. no. That's crazy. And there definitely are that's some crazy. studies. And, you know, <laughs> that's crazy. That's just, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Wow. Sad. So, um, so your own journey. So now you're, you're in the residency program. You're, you're starting to... Um, um, you know, you want to address the skin issues, the eczema, the, um, the sores that you have from jujitsu and, and, uh, and how did, so how did you arrive at a carnivore starting phase? Did, was it, was there some person that you, other than, uh, than, uh, um, Peterson or whatever? I think I'd been kind of trending there. Yeah. Right? I, I was, Paleo, then I was autoimmune paleo, and then I was low oxalate autoimmune paleo, then I was low oxalate, low histamine autoimmune paleo. You just, you just an elimination diet just, to beat all just, elimination you just, diets. Yeah, you, just, you just keep yeah. paring things yeah, down, yeah, yeah. and you're like, well, I got low oxalate, low histamine, low yeah. lectin, yeah. paleo diet. Well, and then I hear this, and I'm like, well, why don't I just try a carnivore diet and do yeah. some research about whether polyphenols have real evidence, or yeah. what the evidence is for polyphenols, what the evidence is for fiber. Let's just try it. Yeah. And it was striking. I mean, it was... Really, people say this, but it, my experience personally was it was within 72 hours, probably within 48 hours. The eczema didn't resolve completely within 42 hours, but my mental state changed yeah. in a way that I never expected. Now, is that is that because of the ketogenic nature of it, or is that because of the, the, the meat nature of it? I wasn't actually doing it in a ketogenic way. Okay. So I hadn't, I'd only dipped my toe into the ketogenic 
sort of pool in the mm-hmm. past. I'd been moderate to yep. low carbohydrate, paleo. I'd never done full keto. And, you know, I was in residency. It was probably somewhere in the middle of my 30 year residency. And I thought, I don't want to do keto. I don't want to keto adapt. I don't want to get keto flu right now. Yeah. So I did carnivore with honey. Wow. Right? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like people say, oh, maybe honey is carnivore because it yeah. comes from bees. Yeah. So that was my hack. And I wasn't actually ketogenic at all. And within two days, and I, the preface to this or the, the context is that I did not feel that I had depression or anxiety or anger issues. But my personal experience was that within two days, I had an improvement in my outlook on life. It was just like somebody changed the color of the glasses wow. I was looking through. I was just more positive, more emotionally resilient, and a little bit happier person. But it was noticeable. Wow. And that was really cool. I thought, that's interesting. There's something to this. Mm-hmm. And I've heard it, people repeat it multiple times now that... Often the mental health benefits or the psychiatric, uh, just the mental clarity benefits, mm-hmm. usually even independent of keto, ketosis, are there with a the carnivore diet. Certainly we know ketogenic diets provide mental clarity and uh, memory now, benefits. Now, do you think that's, again, because of the elimination of other offending agents? Because uh, if it's not keto, then what's causing this mental clarity, this this renewed sense of mood enhancement or whatever? I think it's the elimination. And okay. I think that's the magic that we see across these diets. So there's kind of two pieces in my mind to how to create the optimal diet for humans. It's get the most bioavailable nutrients that you can, get mm-hmm. the highest amount of the most bioavailable nutrients, and eliminate the toxins. Yep. And those are two things. And I think, I mean, there's a hashtag, meat heals. I, I do think that animal foods, and I think you would agree with this, are the clear source of the most nutrient-rich foods yeah. that are the most bioavailable. And I think that the actual, I think that a lot of the improvement for people, because a lot of people eat animal foods, yeah. but I think the magic comes when you get rid of the toxins. The other stuff, sure. Yeah. And, and that's what I think I was experiencing. So I don't know if it's necessarily meat heals, because yeah. a lot of people eat meat. Yeah. It's getting rid of the toxins perhaps allows the immune system to become more quiescent, kind yeah. of calm down. We're not poking it as much with yeah, these, yeah. these fan toxins. No, it's interesting because you know we, when you when you pick a way of eating, there are some nuances to it that make it effective. Um, but there are also some nuances that if you don't if you don't do it right, you can actually do yourself a disservice. And I think that was the, the early stages of all the paleo investigation done by the general uh, you know, scientific community, which would call it a low carb diet, even though it had thirty percent calories from carbs. Right. right? And so now you've got, then they're showing that, you know, because is it the meat that's killing people in this diet or is it the low carb? Well, in fact, it's both because the carbs aren't low enough to generate the effect of a paleo or a primal or even a keto, you know, uh, uh, outcome. Right. So you get sort of, instead of getting the best of everything, you're getting the worst of everything mixed in together, right? Uh, and so with the, uh, with the carnivore diet, if you, by eliminating these things, and I'm, I'm you know, for me, I'm open to it. Look, I, I, I want to believe that it's, that it's a real thing. And, and, uh, I'm trying to find, you know, I'm, I have this confirmation bias going immediately, right? But I've been a proponent of, you know, that base of your diet being, uh, vegetables. Oh. Not just fruits and vegetables, but, but vegetables. So I've, I've said just because I wanted to pay homage to the, you know, to the medical community, I don't want to be that guy who's so far out there that he says, just eat meat. Um, I might be one day. But I, but so I had, you know, uh, vegetables was still the basis of a primal blueprint diet uh, because of the polyphenols, because of the fiber content, because of the micronutrients, because of the, you know, all of those little things that you theoretically were not getting from the choice cuts of meat. Right. But therein lies sort of the big, the, one of the nuances, the choice cuts of meat. So when you, let's just for a second argue that, um, you, maybe you don't need vegetables and fruits to get those micronutrients. If you're eating, you know, a, uh, a, a foraged beast or a grass fed cow or, uh, you know, a free range chicken, uh, and, and antibiotic free and you're eating nose to tail. Nose to tail is the key in my opinion. And nose to tail. And so there, I, there are a lot of people, you know, we talk about dirty keto, a lot of people doing dirty keto. I, I feel like there's a lot of people doing dirt, dirty carnivore. Brad and I were having the exact conversation earlier today. Yeah. Where, where, you know, geez, I love ribeye. So that's all I'm going to have. Or I love, you know, tenderloin or sirloin or whatever. But, but, um, you know, that's, you're not getting the, you know, all of the essential components of a diet. And that may be, and yet I still see people are doing okay. 
you know, on the carnivore diet so far, but I mean, look, after the Irish potato famine, those guys lived on seaweed and shoe leather for six months. The it's, human body is quite resilient. It's very resilient. And we see that even in like plant-based diets, right? There's a yeah. little bit of an event horizon. Yeah. You know, you take it out six months, eight months, a year, then you look how people yeah. are really doing. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I believe that animal foods are clearly the most nutrient-rich and bioavailable. So you could do a lot worse than beef, bacon, and eggs yeah. for a diet. But I, I would agree with you completely that, in my opinion, that's a dirty carnivore diet. Just yeah. like dirty keto or dirty paleo or whatever. Yeah. That's, a, that's a dirty carnivore diet. And we can dig into some of the nuance there. But I think that there's a, there's a, it's intentional. You know, It's like Tim Ferriss has this saying, or at least that's where I think I saw it, not simple, not complex. Yeah. It's, it's not a simple fix. It's not just ribeyes and bacon. I yeah. don't think that's the optimal way to do it. And, and like you said, if you just do that, I believe people are going to get nutrient deficiencies. And those may take years to show up. And then we're just getting to be less than optimal gradually, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. yes, the construction of it is not complex, but it's not simple. Like you said, it's really eating the whole animal in an intentional way and just being a little bit considerate of where different nutrients are coming from. And it all comes together really elegantly, yeah. pretty easily. But yeah. It's not as simple as like beef and bacon. Yeah. Um, I've said for a long time that I, I consider collagen to be a fourth macronutrient. So, um, you know, you've got protein, you got carbohydrate, and you have fat as your three basic macronutrients. You could argue that ketones are a fourth. But, yeah. but I think collagen is such an important component of human nutrition. And it's been, my thesis is that um, up until... Um, 30 years ago, we had all of the, maybe even 20 years ago, we had all of the uh, collagen in our diet that we needed. We ate nose to tail for millions of years. Um, even in the, you know, when after cooking and fire and cooking and everything, we made broths and we, but we still ate, you know, we didn't want to waste any part of the animal. It, it wasn't until the 60s and 70s when we could go to the butcher and only get the choice cut of meat, not get the tail or the nose or the brain or the tripe or whatever. Uh, and so people sort of gravitated toward that. But even in those days, they ate jello for dessert. Or your mother probably took Knox gelatin in a, in a solution for her skin, hair, and nails, <laughs> right? So we still had this raw material that we needed right. to repair one of the more essential components of the body, skin, hair, nails, uh, tendons, ligaments, connective tissue, fascia, cartilage, all this stuff. And that, glutathione. And glutathione. And, uh, by the way, this, the lining of the gut. Yeah. And so one of the things missing, from, like even if you've gone paleo or primal and you've gotten rid of grains and you've gotten rid of sugars and you've gotten rid of industrial seed oils, if you're not consuming the raw materials your gut needs to repair itself, the collagen peptides that are only available, it's really, it's like like for like. You eat collagen to make collagen. It's... It almost sounds too simple, but that's what's been missing from a lot of people's diet. So I feel pretty strongly that collagen is, is, is necessary for everybody, but certainly for people who are on a carnivore, you know, diet. If they're not eating nose to tail, at least get some collagen, right? And then some of our friends are doing these like desiccated nether parts. Yes. Of, uh, organs. you know, of yeah. organs. Yeah. And, and, and so there's a way that you could sort of, you know, hack this thing nose to tail without, you know, forcing your spouse or your, your significant other to make stuff they don't want to make. Like liver. Or yeah, something. yeah. Well, liver is the easiest, but I mean, some of this stuff is pretty, you Kidney know. Or well, yeah, brain. yeah. 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 So, um, I agree completely about collagen. I think that the key with collagen is the methionine glycine ratio. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the things that everybody criticizes a carnivore diet. I yeah. did a podcast with Stephen Gundry recently and a lot of proponents or a lot of people who don't believe a, a meat-based diet. And again, I think the verbiage is important here. I would never call it a meat-based diet. I would call it an animal-based diet. Yes. And that, that includes eating nose to tail. But people who worry about a meat-based diet are saying, well, if you look at the feeding studies that are in rodents, if you overfeed rodents, methionine, which is a sulfur-containing yeah, yeah, amino yeah, acid, yeah. that's relatively higher in muscle than connective tissue, those rodents live a shorter amount of time. Yeah, yeah. And so that is a piece of evidence that gets often repeated and very rarely understood. They were doing methionine overfeeding and yeah, they saw yeah. the animals have a problem. And I think it's pretty clear based on human biochemistry that if we overfeed methionine, yes. we're going to have stress. But it's not the total amount, it's the ratio. Exactly, that's the thing yeah. because they followed it up with yeah. more studies and it wasn't the methionine that was causing it. It was the imbalance with yeah. glycine. So then the next set of studies is really the clincher that people don't really tell you about. Yeah. And that's when they supplemented the rats' diets with glycine. They had life extension. Yeah. And so it wasn't that the methionine was toxic. It's that, and this is so interesting. This is just the elegant balance 
of what we've been doing as humans for 3 million years, when you have glycine and methionine in the proper ratio, which you'll get automatically eating meat and connective tissue, yep. or meat and collagen, or meat and bone broth, everything works out great. Yep. But if you only eat high methionine tissues, the yep. concern is that you're going to get too much methionine. It's interesting, these, these sort of... Um uh, relative ratios versus absolute amounts. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the nature of, uh, a poison isn't so much the, uh, you know, it's, it's the dosage, not the, not the, you know, the concept of the to- toxin in the first place. We see that all the time, actually. Yeah. We see that with micronutrients. I mean, zinc and copper is a great thing. I don't yeah. want to dance too. But I mean, it, you're right. It's, zinc is not a toxin by itself. It's yeah. not an oxidative stressor. But if you overfeed someone zinc, they'll get yeah. copper deficient. Yeah. So you have to have zinc plus copper. Well, yeah. Muscle meat is a really good source of zinc. There's almost no copper in muscle meat. If you just eat muscle meat, I worry you're going to get a zinc defi- yeah, or yeah. a copper deficiency. And where do you get copper? Well, yeah. copper's in the liver. So yeah. it's, it kind of goes back. Same to with iron, by the way. If you eat too much, you know, iron, uh, you know, he, the, the yeah. heme ion and uh, you know the heme molecule. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of men in particular don't have a disposal mechanism for it. It could become problematic if you eat too much. But if you balance it out with with the other minerals, yeah. Um, it's crazy. Or omega-6, omega-3 ratio, same thing. You know, uh, they're both necessary. Um, but if the balance is thrown off, then you have uh, it, one, you know, in, particularly if there's too much omega-6. It's rare there's too much omega-3, but if there's too much omega-6, you have a pro-inflammatory environment, um, which you can, you, again, you can fix just by adjusting the balance, not necessarily by eliminating one, you know, o- o- over the other. And I think people get so hung up on that. They think, oh, I can't, this is too complicated. Yeah. But that's what's so interesting for me is that it's only complicated when you take it out of the simplicity of eating an animal. Yeah. If you eat the whole animal, yeah. you'll be fine. You're, fi- you're done. You know, if you eat yeah. the whole animal, if you eat animal fat from a grass-fed animal, you're going to get an, an adequate amount of omega-3 and an adequate amount of omega-6. Yeah. If you eat the whole animal, you're going to get zinc, you're going to get copper. If you eat the whole animal, you're going to get methionine, you're going to get glycine. Yeah. It's when we start to be reductionist yeah. and change, and this goes back to, you know, the concept of being primal, when we change the things we've been doing for three right. million years, right. humans don't do so well. and. And this gets to the sort of the challenging mental position for a lot of people. Like, a lot of the things we've been doing for three million years are not comfortable for us anymore. No, for sure. Not mentally, not physically, yeah, yeah. whether it's walking around bare feet or getting more sun exposure or getting a little dirt or swimming in cold water or eating an animal nose to tail. People say, I don't want to do that. I just want to, right. eat, I just want to eat a tenderloin steak. And you go, well, there's consequences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you return to sort of the ancestral wisdom yeah. pattern, yeah. it all fits together super elegantly and simply. And you often don't even need to take a lot of supplements. It's just you don't have to worry about the ratios. It's all there. And 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 this whole concept of like feeding the world, which is which is basically, um, we waste so much of the animal yes. now. Yes, we do. You know, and so if if we cut back on uh, you know uh, the disposal of all of the other parts and started consuming that, we'd have actually more calories, more great nutrition. Um, it's 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 one of the answers to the question. Well, what about you know uh, isn't eating meat destructive for the planet and and how are we going to feed all these people? Um, I want to talk a little bit about vitamin C. So, uh, you know, and I'm just going to throw it out there. Like one of my ideas is that uh, Linus Pauling had this whole thing about vitamin C. And, and by the way, um, the three sort of key amino acids that are mostly found in collagen. Um, and he, he had a theory about heart disease caused by lack of glycine and, mm-hmm. and uh, hydroxyproline and a few other amino acids and vitamin C. So his thing was bump. Bump those up and bump vitamin C way up, mm-hmm. partly because we lost the ability to make our own vitamin C and because we're not frugivores anymore. But I might argue that, that the, that the high needs for vitamin C over the past decades was a result of the totality of our diet, um, partly because of the high sugar content, because sugar competes, vitamin C competes for the same receptor site. Uh, as sugar. So if you have a high sugar diet, you have to throw more vitamin C at the organism, right? right? So when you get rid of the sugar and you're eating more of a carnivore, uh, diet, you don't need that much vitamin C. And so the, you know, the, the RDAs and all of the things that we talk about, uh, vitamin deficiencies, they kind of go away because the artificial need for them hasn't been jacked up because of a dietary choice or an inappropriate dietary choice made decades ago. You, Agree with that? I agree. I mean, it's, I don't think people completely know. It's called the glucate, glucose ascorbate antagonism theory. It does appear that in red blood cells and a lot of tissues of the body, ascorbate or ascorbic acid competes with glucose. And so it's, it's definitely a compelling theory. So it's very possible that on low carbohydrate diets, low glucose diets, ketogenic diets are, our requirements for some of these things change. Some of them go up. Some yeah. of them go down. Yeah. 
The other thing that's fascinating to me about vitamin C is there's a series of experiments done in the 1930s and 1940s with conscientious objectors to World War II. Have you heard about these, the Sheffield experiments? They gave people scurvy. Yeah. It took six to eight months. They gave them scurvy. And then they, and then they gave them a small amount of vitamin C and they, the lowest dose they gave them was 10 milligrams of vitamin C. All the scurvy was gone. Yeah. And then they gave people 70 milligrams of vitamin C a day and all the scurvy was gone and there was no clinical difference between the two groups. Between the two groups. Yep. So I, I think vitamin C is a very interesting thread to pull on. Mm-hmm. Clinically, what we see is if you don't have scurvy, there's no evidence with interventional studies that extra vitamin C is good for you in any way. And I think vitamin C, this is kind of the media machine around supplements. They say it's an antioxidant, take more of it. Well, that's never been shown in a study. They give people lots of vitamin C, no better outcomes yeah. in terms of... I was taking 25 grams a day because they used to say to bowel tolerance... I've heard, I had clients that are taking that much. Yeah. And I think there can be bad consequences. No, there's uh, horrible. And I, um, uh, vitamin E is another, uh, good yeah. example of, uh, you know, for the longest time, people were taking alpha tocopherol. Well, alpha tocopherol is one of many tocopherols, right. right? And gamma is probably the more potent one, but it's, but alpha tocopherol, vitamin, vitamin E has been, uh, sorry, vitamin E. Did I say D? D? No, you said E. Oh, okay, just, because I could go down that D rabbit hole too. <laughs> vitamin E. So vitamin E. So, you know, alpha to- tocopherols, be- t- delta tocopherols, they're all this mixed tocopherols. And if you only get one and you get too much of one, it becomes a pro-oxidant. So the very reason you're taking it, because you think it's an antioxidant, now you're like, I'm going to take more because it's so good. More is better. Then it becomes counter- counterproductive and antithetical to, to your health goal. High doses of vitamin C also become pro-oxidants. Yeah. This is a crazy thing. So there's a condition called G6PD deficiency, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, which illustrates this very well. If you give high doses of vitamin C to somebody with G6PD deficiency, you will cause hemolysis. Mm -hmm. So the reason you see that happening is because glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is an enzyme in the red blood cell that does a key thing. It regenerates NADPH. Well, you use NADPH to regenerate glutathione. So when you give someone something that causes hemolysis... In someone with G6PD, that thing is a pro-oxidant, and they're not able to regenerate glutathione enough to k- take care of those oxidative stressors. And glutathione is the body's main resident antioxidant system. Exactly. Works very well on its own if it's, if it's supported appropriately. Exactly. It does. And we yeah. don't, as we'll talk about, we don't need to support it yeah. as long as we're giving it the raw materials to make glutathione. But what we see is people with G6PD deficiency are cautioned against favism or fava beans. Mm-hmm. And this is a, a, a great illustration of how legumes are particularly toxic for humans. Fava beans have a strong pro-oxidant molecule in them. And if someone with G6PD eats a fava bean or beans, yeah. they cannot handle that amount of oxidative stress in the red blood cells the red blood cells burst. The same thing happens with vitamin C in those people, and I would argue the same thing happens with vitamin C in everyone. Yeah. It's just that you'll use your glutathione, you can regenerate your glutathione better than other people. Yeah, you can keep up with the damage. Right, but yeah. you're doing damage, and yeah. that when we overconsume a lot of these things, when in human history would we ever have gotten 25 grams of vitamin C? <laughs> Never. Yeah. You couldn't. Yeah. And if you actually, if you look at what we would be consuming in terms of human history, it's actually really hard to even get 70 milligrams of vitamin C seasonally. Yeah, an orange used to be 60 milligrams, and now I don't even think because of the way we grow fruit, it's probably not even that much. Not even that much. Yeah. It's seasonal, only yeah. certain parts of the yeah. world. It's very rare. I think there would have been large amounts of time where the only amount of vitamin C we were getting was from animals. And that's a pretty radical concept yeah. that we don't even know about because we haven't done the studies. But when you look at the small studies that have been done, there's vitamin C in animals. Yeah. There's vitamin C in muscle meat. There's vitamin C in liver. And the experiments that have been done, you know, at least anecdotally in carnivores, there's never been a reported case of scurvy. I don't take vitamin C. Yeah. You know, my antioxidant status looks great. We can talk about that. But probably much lower doses of vitamin C than we are recommended Mm -hmm. are adequate to do the thing it needs to do. Yeah, and I think, again, if we go back to the RDAs or the DVs, whatever they call it, you know, RDIs, they change, you know, over over the decades. But initially, they were sort of based on a standard American diet. And right. it was a better diet in the 40s when it was originally, um, you know, contemplated that we needed, that the government needed to tell us how much to take in. But it was still based on a largely carbohydrate-based diet. And so the, the, the whole realm of needs shifted as a result of, of, I think, the, the stress that we were putting on our bodies by cons- over-consuming carbohydrates and, you know, and, and for a long time, uh, under-consuming saturated fats and monounsaturated fats. I agree. Yeah. I agree. 
And it's interesting also, just as an aside, that some things actually go up. The need for some things goes up on a ketogenic diet like salt. Yeah. And that's a really key thing for people to know because I think that you've probably written about this in your keto books, but if people are not really on top of their electrolytes when they try a new ketogenic diet, they will run into problems. And there's something called the naturesis of fasting. Mm -hmm. And ketogenic diets mimic fasting in beneficial ways in the human body. We know that a lot of people are worried about things like mTOR and AMP kinase and autophagy, and ketogenic diets have benefits in that they probably trigger some autophagy, some cellular house cleaning, and they they also trigger some of these mechanisms of fasting, which lead to salt loss. Mm -hmm. And so the easy fix mm -hmm. is make sure you're getting enough sodium. And if people are having trouble with you know elevated cortisol levels, potassium wasting because of high aldosterone, they may not know this from doing lab tests, but if they're feeling off. Keto flu is a lot of electrolyte yeah, stuff. Yeah. And so by having a robust electrolyte regimen when you're doing a ketogenic or a carnivore or a ketogenic carnivore diet is a great thing to do because people are getting cramps, they're getting problems with you know potassium deficiency or magnesium deficiency or sodium. A lot of it just has to do with the way that our body shifts the minerals on ketosis, and mm. we have an increased need for salt. Yep. Well, and in a, something that sort of bumps up against that is the back of the brain telling you, I've always heard salt's bad, I have right. to avoid salt, and so whenever I can avoid sodium or buy something with low sodium, I'll buy it. Um, and now, um, you know, there have been a number of books recently about, you know, this, this has not only been bad information, it's been, it's been harmful information to avoid salt. That perhaps that the avoidance of salt has caused more problems in the last decade than, than too much salt. I think it has. We know that if we strictly avoid salt, we will become insulin resistant. Yeah. Our body will create an insulin resistant phenotype in order to conserve that salt. Animals seek out salt in the wild. Yeah. And if animals are limited from salt, they will seek it out at the expense of everything else. Salt is one of the key minerals the yeah. key, that we never think about as humans. But if we did not have salt, we would be in a big hurt. We would oh, be yeah, in a big way. Wars have been fought over this. For sure. And it's nuanced. And I will tell people that even people with high blood pressure should not be worried about salt. The high amounts of salt are not causing high blood pressure. There are yeah. other things. And when we limit salt, even on a high uh, blood pressure position with a patient, they just jack up the renin angiotensin aldosterone access to hang on to it more. Yeah. And it may raise their blood pressure to eat salt, but that doesn't mean salt is the problem. There are other things, I would argue, autoimmune in many cases, causing high blood pressure, which mm -hmm. is fairly radical perspective. But you can't, you got to correct the root cause of the yes. illness with hypertension. It's not salt. It's not salt. Yeah. And by limiting salt in people who have high blood pressure, they're doing themselves more harm. More harm, yeah. Okay, so um, probably the, the, the biggest um, uh, argument that I would get from other people against uh, eliminating vegetables is the whole fiber uh, issue, the whole fiber question. Uh, did you ever read uh, a book called Fiber Menace by yes. Konstantin Monasterski? I've, I've browsed it, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, a really interesting take. I mean, the, the cover of the book, when it first came out, uh, 15 years ago, had a bowl full of brass screws, nails, and, and nails stuff. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's a great um, image. Yeah, it was a it was a very good image, and it was a you know again a, a very um, you know revolutionary concept. And he, he uh, Constantine got you know crapped on by everybody other than some of us who would, you know said it's really there's a lot to this. But he basically said fiber isn't the be all and the end all. It's not. It's not. You don't need it's uh, insoluble fiber to scour out. You know, to visual, envision a broom, a wire brush going down your intestines and scraping the sides off of crap and all this stuff. It's, it's, um, and even the soluble fiber issue was a, was a big thing for him. So, uh, and yet you read the studies about the Bushmen and, you know, they, they, a hundred grams of fiber a day was the, you know, the standard of throughput for some of the you know, Aboriginal people and whatever. I have to tell you that my, my theory of, turds, poop, shit, scat, whatever you want to call it, is that the main reason we do this is bacterial turnover. It's just to get rid of dead bacteria, and there's no need for parts of plants to be going down the chute. Um, so I'm, when people say, well, you know, my, a lot of people go carnivore and say, my, you know, my bowel habits improved. So I hear it so often. Yeah. I hear it so often. And the fiber is a very interesting, nuanced discussion. But if you really dig into the medical literature, 
it is a, it is this is an emperor has no clothes type of a situation. There is really, and I don't want to speak in overly hyperbolic terms, but the evidence that fiber is beneficial for humans is meager at best and probably non-existent. Um, there is no clear evidence that fiber benefits constipation. There are studies which suggest that people that remove yeah. fiber resolve idiopathic constipation. There are uh, colonoscopy series where people who eat more fiber have more diverticulosis, mm-hmm. which is the outpouching of small diverticuli from the gut, which is not a good thing and can lead to diverticulitis. It's not a causal relationship, it's an associative relationship, but it's and then you look at cancer, and the studies with fiber and cancer prevention failed miserably. Mm-hmm. In around 99, 2000, people were trying furiously to show that fiber supplements or high fiber foods would prevent recurrence of colonic adenomas, precancerous lesions. No difference. Right. Just, just crazy stuff that people never hear about. So no benefit with constipation, no benefit with diverticulosis, no benefit with cancer. What is left? Except you're going to get a well. There's the heart. There's, there's the heart disease. Heart right. healthy, you know the um, oat brand sopping up LDL. LDL, which is a very <laughs> that that is a rabbit hole of yeah. rabbit holes. Because yeah, yeah, then we yeah. segue into the conversation around LDL, and I think we could definitely yeah. go down that rabbit hole. And is it actually bad? And I would say it's not. Yeah, I would yeah, say that there's yeah. very clear. Uh, dissenting evidence that LDL, I, I would say it is far from proven that LDL molecules are directly toxic to the endothelium. So, yeah. and, and if you actually look at the LDL lowering from fiber, it is minuscule. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at the blood pressure lowering from fiber, it is minuscule, like on the order of 1.2 millimeters of mercury. Yeah. I mean, we're talking non significant. Uh, differences in any of these things. So the fiber arguments around LDL, I think, are flawed because it it rests on sort of this idea that LDL and well, it, it rests on the cholesterol theory of yes, heart disease, which is yeah hotly debated. Yeah, hotly, hotly debated. And so then I think that the main issue that we come up to with fiber is the microbiome, mm-hmm. and this is a fascinating issue. And I am sort of deeply involved in disabusing people of the notion that there is scientific evidence. I would say I should restate that in more clear terms. I believe strongly there is no scientific evidence that that fiber leads to a healthy gut microbiome. There you go. But that is often repeated. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's parroted at this point. And people will say things like, we know that we need lots of plant fiber to have a healthy gut microbiome. Well, if people are aware of that study, please send it to me because I've never seen it. And believe me, I have looked. Look for it, yeah. And it's a little bit similar. It mirrors the LDL argument because it's based on a theory that has not been proven yet, which mm-hmm. is that we, or at least a hypothesis, that we understand what a healthy gut microbiome yes. is, number one. Yeah. And if people are using alpha diversity, that is a flawed measure of a healthy There's gut microbiome. 3,000 plus species of, of bacteria. And you can have, yeah. you can have a high diversity with yeah. a lot of criminals. Yeah. You know, just because there's a lot of different types of people in an area yeah, doesn't yeah. mean everybody's friendly. Strains, not species, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, it's um, it's it's amazing to me that again, this goes back to that th- th- that theory that the main reason for um, you know your your the the, the uh, throughput in the body is to clear out uh, bacterial turnover, and if you reduce the amount of fiber and you don't need fiber and uh, you reduce the um, the, you know the size of your uh, of your output. Um, what's wrong with that? You know why is that bad? I, I I talk to vegetarians and vegans all the time and say, you know, I want to I want to be sure I go I poop after every meal. I'm like, what the what is that? I mean, that's <laughs> maybe we talk to Freud. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> that's the uh, anal stage. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and then I have I I talk to people who've never had a solid shit in like. Um, you know, 20 years and think that's a good thing because you're not supposed to have a concentrated salt. It's, it's bizarre to me because I think, as, as you say, there's probably, we haven't, we've only begun to scratch the surface of this microbiome thing. And the fact that there are thousands of strains of bacteria and we don't even know, it, it, again, it goes back to that, um, omega-3, omega-6 thing. It may be ratios more than absolute amounts of them. That some that we call bad bacteria might not be bad bacteria. Some of the ones that we say, well, you know, they, they need to make butyric acid, um, f- you know, to feed the, the cells lining the gut. Well, you know, do they? And how does that, how does that happen in, in the absence of fiber? There, there are so many questions here that, that I want answers to. <laughs> there's, the, you know, actually, there's a really fascinating study in cheetahs that I'll send you, and it goes back to collagen. 
In cheetahs, they've seen that collagenous tissue from animals can be fermented in the same way and make straight short-chain fatty acids. There you go. So there's this, there's this sort of uh, disruptive idea that, man, I mean, we can take a collagen molecule and make short-chain fatty acids or butyric acid if you're yep. fixated on that. Yep. I've also seen other research to suggest that when we eat an animal-based diet with zero fiber, we can make other short-chain fatty acids besides butyrate. We can mm-hmm. make propionate, acetate, isobutyrate. The idea that the colonic epithelial cells are starving for short-chain fatty acids yeah, yeah. without plant fiber yeah. is really false. Right. And the other notion that's constantly parroted that just drives me up a wall is that if we don't eat plant fiber, the mucus layer in the gut will get digested. Mm. That's never been shown in mm-hmm. any human study that I'm aware of. There's a study in mice from Cell in 2016, and I think that's the one that everybody likes to parrot, and nobody... I don't think anybody actually knows what research they're talking about. But in that study, they, they took notobiotic inbred mice, meaning they raised the mice with no gut bacteria. They gave them a human-like microbiome, which is clearly a fake microbiome of 14 strains. Yeah, Jesus. Okay. That were all fiber-liking strains. And we know that if you eat a low-fiber diet, your gut shifts to bacteria that like no fiber or mm-hmm. can ferment mm-hmm. fat or use uh, protein. So they, they, they set the whole thing up and they said, oh, look, in the, in the guts of these mouse, you see the mucus layer shrink. Therefore, this is a problem. Well, if you read on in the paper, they did the histology and they say the gut, the mucus layer shrunk a little bit, but we didn't actually see any inflammation in the gut. I'm going, this okay. is news. Yeah. This is like fake news. Yeah. Like, what are we talking about here? This is the study everybody's basing this on. But if you listen to podcasts and you listen to microbiome pundits, You'll hear this. You need plant fiber or the mucus layer will get digested. Well, I've never seen that to be And the mucus layer does what? In the-, the mucus layer is sort of this, what they, people would say is a protective layer between the colonic epithelial cells and all the bacteria. And it just prevents them from touching all the time. Mm. And they say, oh, this is a really bad thing. If you get breakdown of the mucus layer, the bacteria are going to be touching the epithelial cells. They're going to create an immune reaction. And, you know... I think that there is more to the story than we heard. That's an oversimplification. Yeah. To say you need plant fiber to do this is just, that's never been shown in my opinion. It just drives me crazy. And clearly we don't see on carnivore diets people getting inflammatory bowel disease. No. We don't see, I mean, we have quite the opposite. Tens of thousands yeah. of people doing yeah. this experiment now. And in fact, what we've seen is many, Res- resolution from many it. people resolve inflammatory yeah. bowel disease. We don't have 35 or 100 people say, Oh, a carnivore diet gave me Crohn's. Yeah. We're doing the experiments. They're not in a controlled setting at yeah. Hopkins, unfortunately, but we're doing the experiments and we don't see that clinically. So there's a real disconnect here. People are not, you know, answering that. Well, what's interesting about the clinical studies is, um, and we've seen this in the last decade, now there are so many millions of people who've gone paleo. There's so many hundreds of thousands, maybe millions who've gone keto that we almost don't need to do the clinical trials because we have so much, you, you could call it anecdotal, but these are real stories from real people who had real results. And to try and compartmentalize those in a, in a limited study with, you know, confines that, uh, that, um, you know, maybe artificially throw out certain benefits. And, you know, it seems to me that, that, that we're actually now able with the internet, with social media, with access to information, we're, we're conducting these studies without the the benefit or aegis or oversight of the NIH, you know? I agree with you completely. I mean, if you go to meatheels.com, there's hundreds of people that are just independent people writing their stories, yeah. you know? And you look at my Instagram, you look at other carnivores' Instagrams, I post people's success stories, people will comment. I'll just, I'll just do a post and I'll say, have you guys seen this? Or what have you guys seen? Tell me negatives and positives. And occasionally somebody says something negative about a carnivore diet, you know, loose stool, we can talk about the pitfalls. But generally, people are like, yeah, I had the same thing. I had psychiatric disease resolve or polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it's just, you see it over yep. and over and over. Yep. It's an it's a overwhelming uh, amount of information coming at us right now. It's really encouraging. It's really exciting. But I think that the medical community will never be satisfied until we do an RCT. So hopefully, we'll eventually yeah. do an RCT or, or two and yeah. say, hey, look, we told you so. Yeah. But people love to say it's never been studied. It's not controlled. And you say, well, how do you explain... Ten thousand Tens of thousands anecdotes. of uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just to sort of to not leave the, the the fiber discussion. One of the things Monastirsky said, which was uh, you know certain types of fiber, um, they they're bulking fiber, so that you you consume the fiber and then with water either that you consume or that's uh, present naturally in the gut, it expands. You know, and that's supposed to be a good thing because it's supposed to again, you know. Uh, run your plumbing and push stuff through you. But what he says, and I, and I, this goes back a long time and I agree with, I could just envision, you know, the, most of your gut is smooth muscle. 
It's not striated. It does, right. it's not meant to expand. Right. Uh, it's, your stomach is, but, uh, but not your small intestine and, and, and your colon. And to the extent that those get expanded, now they get, uh, that's where the pouching takes place. That's where the, the disruption of the integrity of the lining happens. And then you get the, you know, the, the, the diverticuli and things like that. It's the, the pathology of diverticulosis is debated because there are some populations, particularly Asians, where you see a lot of right-sided colonic diverticulosis, and the cecum is a low-pressure area. For a long time, people thought, oh, diverticulosis is, is pressure, and the fiber, you need the fiber to move things through because it's all pressure pushing things out. And intuitively, it kind of makes sense. If you have a lot of pressure in a tube, you push something out. But then we see diverticuli in, in regions of the colon that are not high pressure, the cecum, for instance. So the most recent data that I've seen that's quite compelling suggests that diverticulosis is probably autoimmune. Mm. You see lymphocytic, and lymphocytes are part of the immune system. You see lymphocytic infiltration in the diverticuli. Now, well, isn't that interesting? Another thing that's autoimmune, right? Yep. I mean, yep. every chronic disease that I've seen, or I shouldn't say every, but I mean, I can't think of an exception. But what if, what if it is every? I mean, there's, there, there's an argument to be made that... that that this dis-ease, this uh, malfunctioning of the human body, this uh, diversion away from the way it's supposed to work, um, is because of some internal system that gets turned the wrong way. Yeah. The immune system starts to fight against itself, recognizes, uh, you know, self, and doesn't recognize self and non-self. So I, I like that simplified concept that not only, you know, is all disease sort of autoimmune in nature, or certainly inflammatory in nature, um, and that much of this is also, a, a, you know, if you talk about the levers, um, 50 to 60 percent diet, you know, there's stress in there, there's sleep in there, there's, there's movement, there's, it, activity is, a, is a, I think, a, you know, one of the levers that we, that we need to pull. Yeah. But um, the bottom line is that all the shit that goes wrong with us we have control over, which is what I've sort of been espousing with Mark's Daily Apple for 16 years now. And that empowers people, yeah. you know, and some of it's knowledge, and I think the knowledge gives people power. That's passe to say it, but it's true, you know, know what your water, know what your water is like, get sun, move a little bit is really powerful, know what's in your food, yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can control these things. So, so I'm, I'm curious, you did uh, Gundry's uh, uh, podcast, he's a friend of mine, and, and we go back a ways, and I'm, I'm, I feel like, you know, he sort of came to that lectin story maybe a little bit later than, than Cordain and, and some of us. But I'm surprised. Is he not all in on the, on the carnivore diet? He, he is still of the opinion. I think we'll release it soon. You know, he, I've heard him say this on other podcasts. He calls himself a plant predator. Mm. So I think from his perspective, he is still hung up on things like TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, which we can talk about. I think there's been some recent Mendelian randomization studies that was just, I think, released in the last month or two that suggested that TMAO is, high levels of TMAO are probably caused by diabetes mm. and they're caused by chronic kidney disease. They do not cause, it's called right, reverse right, causality. Right, yeah. Yeah. So forever with TMAO, people have been saying, oh, there's epidemiology, and this gets into the, the, the rabbit hole of epidemiology and how misleading observational epidemiology can be. People are saying, oh, there's higher levels of TMAO with people with cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease. And yeah, no shit, you know, like, because those things cause high TMAO right, right. because insulin resistance probably causes high TMAO. But Stephen Gundry is, uh, is concerned about high TMAO and what causes, what can also cause high TMAO? Choline, mm -hmm. carnitine from red meat. Well, we know that those are vital nutrients for the health of the brain, the health of membranes. Mm -hmm. Choline supplementation has been shown to improve non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. At the beginning of the show, I talked about a study from McLean where they used a choline supplement to improve bipolar. So right. to eliminate choline and carnitine is to just, that is a catastrophe nutritionally in my opinion, but there are people in the mm -hmm. cardiovascular community calling for that to mitigate TMAO. And, you know, but he's very concerned about TMAO from red meat. Mm -hmm. He's concerned about these methionine studies. And I would suggest politely and respectfully that his uh, perspective on the blue zones is incorrect. Mm -hmm. That he's hyper-focused on the, the diets of the blue zones. And I would argue the blue zones are a series of cherry-picked, you know, blue zones. Yeah, yeah. Because there are plenty of places in the world that people have very exceptional longevity where they eat a lot of meat, like yeah. Iceland yeah. or the Nicoya region of Costa Rica where the males have exceptional longevity. And I didn't get to talk to him about this in the podcast, but I wanted to mention it to him. There is a really incredible study from Loma Linda, which is mm -hmm. one of the blue zones. It's actually somewhere that he lived, and I think he was a professor at Loma Linda University, 
the medical school, and they looked at sperm quality. And we know that in males, motility of sperm and sperm quality is a measure of nutritional uh, adequacy. And what did they find in vegans and vegetarians in Loma Linda? Very poor mm-hmm. sperm hypomotility mm-hmm. and very poor sperm numbers. So I thought, oh man, that's a blue zone and you guys have very poor reproductive health. That yeah. doesn't look good to me. So yeah. I think he gets hyper-focused on those things and isn't quite on board with carnivore just yet. I don't think he's anywhere near on board with carnivore. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. He's, he's definitely appreciates lectins. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the major problems with plants, but he has a lot of issues with the, the animal-based stuff. So yeah. I, tried to, I tried to talk to him about it. No, no, it. no it's, it's, I, again, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I would like more people in the, uh, in the medical community to embrace this concept. Um, what do you have, like, what is your wish for, what does the next five years look like for the carnivore community? I think, um, I think it's more resources for people. I'm writing a book, mm-hmm. and I'm excited to put that out there so people can hear the story and the written word, and they can look at the studies that I've learned from and kind of follow my thought process. And I think that more and more people need to hear about it. And I want to have more of these discussions with people who are dissenting. You know, other physicians and people in the space who say, that's crazy. And say, well, let's, let's have a conversation and talk about why you think this isn't a good thing. Right. So I'm just excited for it to become more well known and to give people, uh, a simple, but, you know, a complex, but not simple tool to mm-hmm. be able to do it in their own life if they're not at the place they want to be, you know, if they're not feeling like they're optimally healthy, if they're having autoimmune disease that isn't resolving on their current dietary stuff, if they're having psychiatric issues or autoimmune or inflammatory issues, I'm just excited to share it with more people and continue having these conversations because they bring up, like we're suggesting, they challenge so many of these ideas and they make us think so much like maybe what we've been told is wrong. And I love that process. So I'm just excited for it to get out there for more people and for people to think about it and share their ideas with me and to share their concerns or their objections with me mm-hmm. and just to get further the discussion and make it more available to people in an approachable way. So do you think a carnivore diet is is appropriate for everyone, if, if executed appropriately? I do, I do. This is kind of a loaded question and I'll just clarify it. So I was just hanging out with Chris and Mark Bell in Sacramento and Chris asked me, do you think... I, 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 Costco shares go up. Every time those guys go shopping. I know, I know, I know. I'm trying to get the, you know what was interesting yeah. is I talked to them a lot about fat and we can talk about a fat to protein ratio on a carnivore diet when it's yeah. well constructed, yeah. but I got them excited about grass-fed beef fat. I thought that was a little win yeah. um, because the yeah. grass-fed fat is going to be- They're great guys, by the way. They are great guys, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 They, and, but they do eat a lot of meat. Although Chris is having some great results with a higher fat carnivore diet. We can talk about that. So- you know, Chris asked me, do you think there's one optimal diet for every all humans? And I say, yes, and, mm-hmm. right? So in my opinion, it's just my opinion, you know, mm-hmm. sort of my pontification or my postulate. If we look evolutionarily, if we look at what we know about human diets and human biochemistry and nutrition, I think there's a very basic diet that gives us all the nutrients we need and that everyone on the planet could eat that diet and thrive. And the, the and part of that statement is that it appears to me that people have genetic ability to tolerate more or less plants on top of that. Mm-hmm. So you can start with this basic template, and then some people get to put more things on top of that right. and are not going to be triggered autoimmune. I don't think everyone on the planet needs to eat a carnivore diet. I don't think everyone on the planet um, is going to eat a carnivore diet. And I think for some people, the variety in foods, the color is going to help them create the healthiest diet that works for them. But I do think at this point that a basic nose to tail, well-constructed carnivore diet will be the ideal template for all people. Mm -hmm. And some people, many people perhaps, have the ability to tolerate a variety of plant foods on top of that. Some people might not be able to tolerate any plant foods on top of that. You know, Michaela Peterson is a great example. She gets triggered with everything, right? And there are people, probably some of the people with the most advanced autoimmune disease who can't do anything but that. And that's, that's not, that's okay because in that diet, you have, I believe, all the nutrients that a human needs to function optimally in the most bioavailable form. So it is sustainable Mm -hmm. and I would argue healthy for a human. But a lot of people can have an avocado or lettuce or maybe they can have a mango or a mm-hmm. banana and they're not going to get triggered. But if they eat a tomato, yeah. they're going to get low back pain. Yeah. Or if they eat nuts and seeds or dairy, mm-hmm. they're going to get eczema or they're going to get acne. So what about you? Where are you on that, on that spectrum? Well, you know, personally, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm an explorer, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like at this point, I have realized that for me right now, a nose to tail carnivore diet strictly works best for me. Mm-hmm. I recently had an experiment um, where I tried to incorporate A2 dairy. 
So this idea of A1 mm -hmm. versus A2 mm -hmm. dairy, people may have heard the idea that in dairy there is a protein called casein. And based on the lineage of the cow, um, there are some cows that have an A1 casein most variant. Most cows. Yes, most cows in yeah. the U.S., A1 casein variant. Yeah. And that breaks down into a protein called beta casein morphine 7. And that's, there's some good studies that suggest that that may be triggering autoimmunity and issues for people. So I'm not a fan of A1 dairy. It may also be a reason, like, a lot of people think that they're lactose intolerant. Right. But they're not. They're casein, they're A1 casein intolerant. Exactly. But they, and they can't drink milk, thinking it's because they're lactose intolerant. But if you look at goat's milk or sheep's milk or buffalo milk, it's A2. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, one of the nuances of a carnivore diet is how do I get calcium? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, am I going to do bone meal? I think we probably would have eaten fish bones and small animal bones, chicken bones. Mm -hmm. That's where we would have gotten most of our calcium. But I thought, let me see if I can incorporate A2 dairy back into my diet. In the last week, I was trying that, right? Mm -hmm. So I got raw goat's milk. I got, you know, sheep's milk. And I was just trying it. And within th four days, which is exactly the time frame of a, you know, a, a, a hypersensitivity reaction mm -hmm. with a T cell reaction. I had a little bit of eczema on my wrist and this wrist, which is where I always mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. And I had a little on my hip and I was like, there it is. I can't wow. do it. Wow. So I'm not, I'm sensitive to even A2 goat's milk dairy and I'm back to the drawing board on a calcium source for me. So that was my experiment. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people can follow that template. And that's where this idea of a nose to tail carnivore elimination diet could be powerful. There's going to be a chapter in my book, How to Be Carnivore-ish, yeah. right? And I think that it's very powerful. Elimination diets are probably one of the most powerful interventions we have for uh, in functional medicine. People could easily do a well-constructed nose to tail carnivore diet and say, you know what, I love this. I don't need to add plants back ever. Or they can say, I'm only going to do it for 30 days. I'm going to see how I feel. If mm -hmm. they feel better, great. We've won. Now let's add some things back. What yeah. do you want? You want dairy? Let's add back some dairy. Oh, you get triggered? Okay, let's go back to square one. Yeah. And they can add things back. And maybe people can just, maybe what they'll find is they end up on a primal diet. Mm -hmm. They end up with like an autoimmune diet. Or they mm -hmm. just don't do lectins. I think a lot of people will end up, will end up at yeah. low lectin primal diet. You know? Yeah. I think that's where a lot of people will end up. But some people will probably feel better without any any of the plants at all. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm probably so, going to stick with nose to tail. All right. So you think, strictly. again, a well, a well constructed carnivore diet is the perfect elimination diet. Clearly, you have to eat something. You have to get calories somewhere. You have to get macronutrients somewhere. You want, you know, healthy fats. You want enough protein. Um, you want some collagen. Yeah. Um, you don't need much in the way of carbs. So that would be the, the, the quintessential elimination diet. And then I would say, uh, because my theory about human nature is we do what we can get away with, right? right. So, um, a lot of people, um, you know, typically, I talk about this a lot in, in, in discussions, uh, and, and talks that I give about how, you know, we tend to see what's the most amount of food I can eat at this meal and not right. feel like crap. Or what's the most amount of this cheesecake I can have and not, you know, blow up. Or what's the most amount I can eat over a course of several days, um, and not gain weight. So we tend to, we go right up to the edge of what we can do. Uh, some people are more, you know, uh, intentional about what they're doing, would say, okay, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, sort of take the opposite approach, what's the least amount of food I can eat and, and maintain energy and maintain health and maintain muscle mass and power and strength, and most importantly, not be hungry, for instance, right? Because hunger screws everything up, right? right. So, um, but we have this built-in human nature, first of all, to overeat. We are wired to overeat. Yeah. That's just part of who we are. So if you can tame that, and if you can tame that by eating intentionally to the extent that you become metabolically flexible and now you derive energy from stored body fat instead of needing to eat carbohydrates right. in a meal. That's a huge part of the equation. Um, but you get to the point where, for me, um, I like, I love the idea of a carnivore diet and yet I like a crunchy salad every once in a while, you know? Right. But it's so funny, I went to lunch with some, somebody the other day and I said, uh, I'm gonna, I'll have the Cobb salad. It, you know, I'm gonna see salad, you know, tomorrow. It might be, so this might be the last salad I ever have. I don't know. So, so, so enjoy the hell out of it, right? And it, it brings up this interesting concept of signal versus noise and how valuable an elimination diet is. A lot of us, myself included, don't really have a sense of the way a certain food might be affecting us until we eliminate it, until we go super simple and we add one food back. It sounds tedious, but it's very powerful. Yeah. And so a lot of people will say to me in Instagram or wherever, why should I eliminate vegetables if I feel good? And I'll say, well, my anecdotal experience was I thought I was really good and yeah. I eliminated vegetables. I felt even better. better. Yeah. And so if, if people are comfortable wherever they are, then fine, don't eliminate vegetables. I don't think there's any reason to, I'm not going to tell you how to eat, but if they want to optimize, it's a very powerful experiment to make it very simple mm -hmm. and then to add back and say, you know what? Like, 
I feel, I don't feel any different after the Cobb salad, or actually I do feel a little different, mm-hmm. and I feel a little better when I don't have it. Or maybe it's some component of the Cobb salad right. that, you, that you feel better without, or there's a little GI thing, or something is a little different. But people, we have such complex diets now, as Americans, as Westernized, it's a, it's a privilege. Yeah. That it's very hard for people to separate signal from noise. And one of the feedback things I hear about carnivore diets is people will say, I got more sensitive to food when mm-hmm. I went on a carnivore diet and I couldn't add it back in my diet. And I think the other hypo- the other possibility the part of that is, that is that you were always sensitive and, and you now, got immune to the pain. And now you know. Now you know. Exactly. And they say, I yeah. can't add anything back in my yeah. diet. I say, what yeah. are you trying to add back? Peanut butter? Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, yeah. That's, a, that's, no. that's really going to trigger you. I mean, that's that's... That's the good news, bad news about some of these elimination diets is that now you know. So now, now you know. it's your own fault if you add that shit back. Now you, you cause you know. Yeah. Um, so that's again, but if you think you can get away with it, if you feel, if the, if the, you know, three minutes of gustatory pleasure is worth the next five hours of discomfort, then go for it, right? But at least you know. You know. Yeah. And I always recommend to people this concept of the, the quality of life. Mm. As a physician, I think, you know, all of us in this space are trying to help people have the highest quality of life. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to take away people's quality of life by, yeah. make, by giving them an, an eliminated yeah. diet or, or by a very restrictive diet. If their highest quality of life in that moment is eating a piece of birthday cake with their son and they know they're going to be, you know, have GI distress, but it's worth it, then do that. Yeah. You know, that's the highest quality of life in that moment. And that's the resiliency of the human body, too, yeah. is that it's not, that will not kill you. Nope. Just a lifetime of it will, or even, you know, a decade of it will. But in the moment, the only thing that's going to happen is, is real discomfort. But again, you weigh the consequences you weigh against the, consequences. the pleasure. Yeah. And yeah. for, I think for a lot of people, 90% of the time, the highest quality of life is going to be eating clean. Yeah. And 10% of the time, they're going to be out with friends and they want to have a beer. Yeah. Or they want to have French fries. And it's like, do that. Just yeah. be aware of it and yeah. know, hey, this is probably going to make me feel bad. Maybe I'll take some charcoal or something to mitigate it. Who knows? Yeah. And, that's okay. This is my highest quality of life. And I can go back to eating, yep. you know, better when I want. But, it, but you have the tools. Yeah. You have the power. You can switch back. And you're, in that way, you're always getting the highest quality of life. And you can, every individual is going to define that in the moment for themselves. Sure. No, I mean, quality of life is like, am I enjoying the moment now? And are there, you know, are there no consequences that are deleterious, you know, uh, downstream? Um, but quality of life, I, I've said for the longest time, there's a guy across the street, he weighs 350 pounds, he's eating pizza, and he's, and he's downing, you know, uh, liters of Coca-Cola, but he's at level 75 on the video game he's playing, and he is king of the world. Who am I to judge that his life sucks? Right? If so he's happy. Yeah, if he's happy. Yeah. If he's happy and. I just want to pay his medical bills. <laughs> yeah, right. We shouldn't be, <laughs> yeah. we shouldn't be responsible for paying his medical yeah, yeah, bills. Yeah, yeah. And when he, if he comes, you know, later, if he, if he complains and he says, hey, I wish somebody told me. It's like, hey, this information's out there. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I worked as a physician assistant and I've quickly realized it was not my place to tell people how to eat. Yeah. When they were curious, they would ask me. And that's the way I feel about my practice now. I'm not looking to sell this to anyone. No, no, no. How many people do you know would come up to you and go, Paul, you have so much information. My friend's like vegan. Would you convince him right. about your carnivore right, right, diet? Right. And I was like, no, that's not my job. Not my job chance. is not. When, if he comes to me and he's really interested, I'll give him, you know, I'll tell him what I know and I'm happy to give him information. But I'm not proselytizing. I'm not here to change anyone's mind. People always send that. Yeah. Send me some resources so that I can argue with these vegans. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Like, <laughs> yeah. don't even bother. Like, if they're happy and they want to do it, let them be, you yeah. know? Yeah. If they're curious... You've got my full attention. You know, yeah. if somebody came to me with a, a heartfelt plea and said, hey, I'm ready to change. Help me do it. I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll give it to you right now. I'll yeah. give you for free. Exactly. I'll tell you how to do it. You know, if somebody walks up to me at KetoCon in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'll give you five minutes of my time for free. I'll tell you how to do it. You yeah. know, I'm not going to walk over to that guy, you know, at the keto cookie booth and be like, hey, man, you shouldn't eat that. Yeah. That's not that's not my place. Right. Cool. I think that's a great note to end on. So if people want to find out more about you and what you do and how to maybe interact with you, tell us how. So I've got a podcast of my own. It's called Mm -hmm. Fundamental Health. It's on iTunes and all the outlets. And people can go to my website, which right now is paulsaladinomd.com. That's the best place. I'm also on Instagram. You can find all those links through my website, but paulsaladinomd on Instagram, mdsaladino on Twitter. I see patients individually, private clients throughout the world. So if people want to work with me, they can send me an email. My email is listed on the website. But check out my podcast and just go to the website if you want to find out more about me. Cool. I'm so glad you stopped by today. It's great to, it's great to chat, man. It's super yeah, yeah. exciting. Yeah, and best of luck in your new endeavors in San Diego. I'm pretty stoked. I'm living like six blocks from the beach. Oh, perfect, perfect. It's going to be really good. Cool. And that's it for this podcast. We will see you next time.
Thanks for tuning in.